Hello, Paul Arreter with uh, Medscape Infectious Diseases and uh, at uh, the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in the Division of ID. Uh, I thought I would discuss two patients that had rather a surprising explanation for gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, as an ID consultant, we often uh, are asked to see patients that have difficult or hard to understand problems. And certainly, uh, we see our share of people that might have <clears throat> uh, persistent symptoms after traveler's diarrhea, things that might resemble irritable bowel syndrome and so on. But there were two patients that um, we actually, I think, came to uh, what would be a clinical diagnosis, but one that seemed uh, very apt and not one that I initially considered at all. So I thought it'd be worth sharing with you in case you might see similar patients. Uh, uh, these are two quick cases I'll mention. Uh, both were women. The first was a woman in her early 60s who um, I had seen uh, in the past for fever of unknown origin, which actually uh, was due to recurrent aspiration and polypharmacy. But uh, she was otherwise well from that standpoint, and because of the pandemic, I hadn't seen her in a while. But she came in with complaints of really unrelenting nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, uh, four to five loose stools a day. Uh, she really almost had no respite although she lacked any fever. Uh, you know, her past history had hypertension, uh, hypogammaglobulinemia, interestingly, and uh, years of mild irritable bowel syndrome. And this was clearly a out of character for her. And in fact, objectively, uh, she had lost 45 pounds since her last visit before the pandemic. Um, she had a, uh, she lived out of town and uh, had a significant uh, evaluation before, including a CAT scan that was only remarkable for swelling in the stomach, uh, didn't look inflammatory, and, and she had a upper and lower endoscopies, which were completely unremarkable, including duodenal biopsies, which ruled out celiac disease and uh, Whipple's disease and so on. Um, uh, stool studies were unremarkable. She had a normal thyroid and she had a mild elevation in C-reactive protein <clears throat> and uh, uh, really had very little improvement from anything symptomatically. So we have that woman with dramatic weight loss and GI symptoms. And then we had a, a woman in her late 70s uh, who had uh, a different situation with some abdominal pain that had more of a colicky nature. In fact, I thought it sounded like renal colic um, <clears throat> uh, on the left side, but then became a little more diffuse. These attacks would be severe doubling over and she really thought strongly about going to the emergency room. They would be so bad. And then they would sort of subside. She'd have some uh, loose stools. She also had dizziness with this. And interestingly, for the past uh, four to five months, had some unexplained uh, shortness of breath episodes, generally when exercising, playing tennis indoors that we thought might be some kind of allergic reaction. Her past medical history here was likewise uh, remarkable for hypertension. She also had uh, treated MAI, and she didn't uh, seem to have anything new uh, in terms of recurrence of MAI or anything of that nature. And her CT scan, uh, when she was feeling relatively well, was uh, completely without any explanation. So when you see these kind of patients that might have unexplained weight loss and uh, uh, GI symptoms, there's always a concern from patients and, and referring doctors, uh, whether there's a hidden infection, uh, especially with bloating and diarrhea. I always think about Giardia and Cryptosporidia, uh, for example. Uh, in older patients such as these, perhaps bowel ischemia is at play on an intermittent basis. Um, if someone had diabetes or perhaps amyloid gastroparesis, uh, uh, whether there's uh, intentional or unintentional laxative use, uh, hyperthyroidism, maybe bizarros like uh, VIPoma, uh, Whipple's disease or celiac disease, but these actually had been mostly addressed in both of these patients with no explanation. Of course, one was a little milder and the other uh, quite severe, but I'll tell you on exam, the first patient that lost 45 pounds looked completely well. A and so did the 70 uh, year old woman. Uh, so none of them looked sickly with this. And uh, the key to the case was actually the patient out of town after having suffered symptoms for many years, uh, I'm sorry, uh, many months, 
uh, had a, about a facial swelling um, around the eyes and lips, but no shortness of breath. And she went to the emergency room and uh, correctly, um, I believe, uh, thought that it might be due to one of her antihypertensives, that's lisinopril, a member of the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor class. Uh, she had that stopped and when she came to see me for a routine appointment, she had a remarkable cessation of her abdominal uh, symptoms completely. Um, now, uh, when I heard this story, she still didn't know why they had stopped. And I uh, had thought about this and it sounded like she is someone that not only might have had uh, ACE inhibitor induced angioedema, which strikes up to perhaps 0.1 to 0.7% of patients taking it, but she may have had the rather rare presentation of visceral or so-called abdominal or bowel angioedema. Uh, and uh, this is described more rarely. And then even on top of that, she had late onset uh, uh, development of this because she had been on lisinopril for about 16 years, although she had some interruptions in its use. So this was late onset, which is also uh, described. And, you know, someone that's been on a drug for so long, you wouldn't think it would come about. And then uh, in retrospect, uh, the, the woman in her 70s had lisinopril started for hypertension uh, uh, probably a few months before these unexplained shortness of breath attacks occurred, even though she had no facial swelling or so on. Uh, but really these abdominal attacks became more prominent. So. In closing, uh, a couple things. I, you know, you always learn from your patients and listen and uh, try to put things together. And, and this was a, a one to me that still required putting pieces of the puzzle together. But uh, looking in the literature, this is rare but described. Um, so I think if uh, the take home message is if you have someone that you're seeing with unexplained GI symptoms and they're on an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, please. Uh, take it as a consideration to uh, cease uh, uh, prescription and observe. Uh, in both cases, we did not re-challenge the people. Uh, so this was a clinical diagnosis, but the symptoms uh, subsided uh, in both cases. Uh, and the, the other is that there can be late onset angioedema. Again, not typical. Usually it will occur in the first few months or even sooner uh, of uh, taking this class of drugs. And uh, why it occurs, a uh, number of theories, but it seems to be due to buildup of kinins uh, that then triggers the angioedema in a subset of people. So uh, as always, I'm always grateful for patients and uh, their stories and hope that uh, these two patients might uh, somewhat be helpful in your uh, practice and future evaluations as well. Uh, thanks so much for listening. And there are a few references. There are many case reports by pulled out a few that included some uh, review of the literature that if you wanted to look further, may be helpful.